All right, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Kansas City by Justin Moy. How are you doing, Justin? John, I'm doing fantastic, man. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be on. Yeah, and Justin has been in real estate uh, your entire professional life, started out saying, selling single family homes in the third most competitive market in the country. And you were able to come to a producer within your second year at the largest firm in the area. In the area. And um, what we want to talk about really today is your whole approach to, to selling and particularly with neuro-linguistic um, programming, NLP, and how you yeah. integrated that in the study of language in, into selling, which is, which is really interesting. So first of all, um, Justin, um, take us back to, you know, when you first started selling and you came in, I mean, you became successful very quickly, but when did you start yeah. to discover that there were these other elements like NFT, things that you could really bring in, bring to bear? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, soon enough <laughs> that I discovered a lot of those things. So really, you know, I found success early on relative, but, um, you know, it was a, an extremely long and grueling ramp up period to becoming successful. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in real estate sales, you know, it's a hundred percent commission role. I actually didn't get my first listing until about six months in. So it's a long time to go without a paycheck. Um, and actually, you know, I, I had, I had decided that I was going to quit right before I got my, my first listing. So, you know, I, I determined that I was going to quit the business. It wasn't working out for me. Um, and, you know, I took my headset off. I was cold calling all day saw one more listing potential kind of pop up on my screen, decided to call them. And that ended up being my first listing. Um, and that she also bought her home with me, ended up being about $60,000 commission to me as my first sale. Nice. So that's when I determined, hey, there's something behind this. And you know, if I need to get really, really educated on this. Thankfully, I had mentors that at the time said, hey, you, know, you have to study sales. You have to study how to build relationships. You have to study how to make yourself a better person. That way you don't have to go another six months without getting sales. You kind of hone your craft in um, and your conversions are higher. Your conversations go better. You don't get told no as much. And so that's when I really became a student of sales and, and really everything around it, how to increase close rates, how to build relationships better. Um, and, you know, I kind of dove in both feet into really honing in that craft because I really realized that it's a, it's a phenomenal way to make a living. And it's a phenomenal way to build your personal network and, and your personal growth as well. Yeah. And what, what's interesting about what you just said there is like, luckily you were surrounded by good mentors or you sought them out. Didn't you? Yeah. More to the point. Uh, you yeah. Them out and they gave you the advice to right. actually study the career that you're in. Yeah. Here, here's a problem, as you know, Justin, with a lot with sales. Is it's a career a lot of people default into. So, yeah. so a lot of people go to go to college and maybe do a marketing degree or whatever, and then come out and discover, oh, there's only like there's two marketing jobs for every like five yeah. sales jobs. So, <laughs> so, so they never, but the problem is they always kind of feel like I'm not really in the job I'm supposed to be in. So they don't invest in themselves. Yeah. And, you know, the big common thing you hear, and I was a marketing major mm -hmm. in college as well. And that's kind of the the joke in that major is at the marketing career fair, like these are all sales jobs. These are all direct sales jobs um, because that's kind of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I determine like prospecting, in my opinion, is marketing. Yeah. You know, I'm calling, calling, calling. It's just a different form of marketing. It's, it's interpersonal marketing. So they do overlap. But yeah, a lot of people default into it. And a lot of people really get get ironically sold on this idea that like, oh, you have unlimited income potential. You could make this much the year, you know, you can make as much money as you want. And all those things are true. But what people determine when they get into the game is, oh, I don't like sales. Yeah. Well, you got to ask more questions. Well, why don't you like sales? Well, I don't just don't like the job. This isn't the job for me. Okay. Well, what if you from day one were just super successful? Mm -hmm. What if you were winning the President's Club, you were in the Century Awards, you were winning the number one prize, you've won every contest, people were asking you for advice, hey man, how do I close the sale? You know, would you like it then? Most of the time they say, yeah, that sounds like it'd be nice. Okay, so it's not that you don't like sales, it's that you're not good at sales. Right. Okay, that sounds right. Okay, and you're not going to get better at sales if you don't practice, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to get better at your practice if you don't study. So I think that's such an important designation is, yeah, most people don't like sales because they're just flat out not good at it. And it's natural to not like something that you're not good at. Yeah. But sales, like any muscle, like any skill, 
can be learned and you can really, really start to love this field when you become a student of the game. Yeah, and I know beautifully put, Justin. Absolutely, and and it's funny because yeah, some the reasons why some people uh, like react like that to sales, even when they're in sales, is you know they kind of get caught up in the popular culture and the negative stereotypes about selling. Yes. And you always hear things like, "Well, I don't want to be pushy, and I don't want to push things on people." And you're going, well, yeah. "Why would you push things on people? Like, yeah, in this place. Why wouldn't you find if you find a product or service um, that you believe in that you're passionate?" Mm-hmm and and then go solve problems for people yeah i think that's so important i I, and i truly believe and if you don't like sales because you don't like the product you're selling i actually think that makes you a better person than maybe the average person who says i'll sell whatever it doesn't really matter because these powers have to in a way be used for good right i mean it's Mm -hmm. the art of persuasion it's the art of making people feel and think a certain way and you have to truly with all your heart believe that what you're selling that product or that service can truly help that person out it's like, you know, I, we were talking before we started recording, I'm a big, uh, my sales influence is a lot of Jordan Belfort style. And his famous question is, you know, sell me this pen. How would you sell me this pen? And a lot of people don't know that the answer to that question is the first thing you should do is ask, well, do you need a pen? Yeah. You know, you're not selling something to people <laughs> that don't need something, but you know, the whole joke of, well, sell me this pen and people start talking about, well, the pen, it's ballpoint, it's really smooth, it's blue in ink, and that's really professional. That's not the point. You need to find out if they even need a pen. And if they don't need a pen, you move on. If they do, now you can start talking about it. So yes, loving your product and loving your service and truly believing in it is huge. And if you don't have that right now, don't stop until you find a product like that because then you're going to love selling even more. Yeah, the, the other thing that uh, the other thing that often gets me, and I, I used I, I I ran a sales consulting company some years back, you know, global, and, and what always made me laugh was some of the biggest companies in the world. When we'd go to do an initiative with them, they'd say, "We, are, are, we don't call our sales salespeople." <laughs> what do you call them? And they say, "Well, like they're business development executives or whatever." Yeah, I always say, "I say, yeah, no, that's fine." Uh, I said, "But, but I'll just tell you one thing: you do know." that your customers and prospects know your salespeople. You can call yourself whatever you want. They know yeah. the salespeople. So I would embrace it rather than run away from it. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I mean, people get so fancy with their titles. And now, you know, I, I stepped um, away from residential real estate. I'm mm-hmm. in a commercial real estate. Oh, okay. And this is something that I've noticed in this field specifically. People get so fancy with the titles, like everybody is a vice president or above. <laughs> It's like you're the vice president or you're the senior vice president. That's like maybe a real one. Then there's like a district vice president, right? And so people get so fancy with the titles. And yeah, at the end of the day, you know, man, hey, you're a sales guy. I'm a potential customer for you. You know, let's just get down to it. You know, what do yeah, you, what you be, got for me? Exactly. Like just be the best salesperson you can be and really help the other person. I keep using an example. I had a guy um, a year and a half ago come in because I had to do redo the air conditioning. And like, let's face it, how exciting is that to get you? Yeah. Know? unit <laughs> did a couple of different companies this guy came in tall you know great you know san diego yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he f- freaking loved jc right and yeah. he everything about it. and he got me excited about it and he told me what i did need what i didn't need all of this stuff i went away with a fantastic experience and now here's a bizarre thing i get a good feeling when i walk by my air conditioning unit how many people does that happen to yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the experience I think is so important. It's because, you know, a lot of sales, it's not so much, uh, it's not as much like a script. Like a lot of sales people are always looking like, what's the magic script? Like, oh, this script I closed, you know, 90% of my prospect. Yeah. You know, the script is just part of the experience. Yes. If the prospect or the potential customer doesn't have a good experience leading up to your your closing script, it does. I don't care what script you hit them with. It could cover every logical, check every box that answer all the objections. They are still going to walk away not feeling good and, and mm-hmm. saying no. So yeah, your their experience is going to be the number one thing that matters. Scripting and those things are just part of the experience, but you can't make up for a poor experience or you know lack of energy or lack of excitement. You can't make those things up with something like a script. You have to have a well-rounded you know presentation or talk. That experience, that customer experience, just is irreplaceable with anything else. Yeah, and there's another thing recently. Um, there's been there's been a lot of uh, you know surveys and stuff done recently about you know where people are because of all the things that we've been through. And yeah. we came through, and some people tell me on a lot of different surveys they've seen it is that people. It's very simple. People want to be seen, heard, and understood. And if you're in, mm-hmm. 
that's what your prospect wants. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. So ask your questions and then validate because they want to be understood. And if they feel that they were seen, they were heard and you understood them, you're in great. Yeah. yeah. Even little nuances like like little little bits of mirroring, um, using the exact terminology they use. You know, yeah. if, if, if they're talking about boats and they say boat and you say kayak, you know, that there's a difference there. So that's also the study of language. Like how can you really make sure that this person understands that you're listening to them? You hear what they're saying. Little tidbits like that will, will set you up in, in better succession, especially in your study of language and your study of really how do humans perceive things and how do certain words, no matter how little they sound, how do they just make people feel differently mm -hmm. and maybe they can't put a put a finger on how they feel or maybe they can't quite talk about man this sales guy i don't know you know everything he said sounded good but i just don't know about him i, I still said no it's because probably the words you use the minor little details you use or left out just made them not feel good and that's what loses you a lot of these opportunities yeah, no, that's a great point uh, because obviously people always remember how you how you made them feel like. Yeah. Is that a Maya Angelou? I'm not sure who where that comes from. <laughs> it's true. I yeah. don't remember what you said, but I remember how you made them feel. Um, yeah. to, that, to that point, Justin, what are some what are some examples uh, of words like that? Maybe little words, maybe the way they're delivered, yeah. maybe with the way they're used that people may be unaware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one huge thing, and you know, NLP and neuro linguistic programming is a vast, vast, vast study of all the my, the little nuances of language. And so, I'll highlight one big thing. Like, if you listen to this show and you just you learn one thing about NLP in in relation to sales, it's going to be reinforcing certainty. Mm. There are certain ways that you can reinforce certainty, or you'll remove certainty. And the very, very top of mind thing we want prospects to feel when we're talking to them is certain, yep. certain in their product, in your product, certain in you, certain in your company, and certain in the experience they're going to have after they sign up with you. So little words. I, I've always told people who are getting into not even just sales, but just life in general, because I'm, I'm in the part of people who believes that everybody's in sales, sure. but even if you're not in direct sales, how do your words either project certainty or project doubt. Weak words like try, like sort of, kind of, yeah, maybe. You know, all of these words, they're so little and they're so minor, but they make a huge impact. Like, John, I'll give you an example. Right. If it's your birthday this Saturday, mm -hmm. which will be, I think, April 21st, and you say, you come to me and you say, Justin, man, my birthday is this Saturday. You know, will you be there? Can you make it? And I say, okay, John, yeah, I'll try. Mm -hmm. What does that I mean, tell you? I know you're not coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not showing up to your birthday party. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just one little word. Okay, I'll try. Try is such a weak word that it just projects doubt. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I'll try. Or yeah, you know, that, that might sound like a good idea. Well, what does might sound mean? Yeah, does yeah. it sound like a good idea or not? You're leaving too much gray area. And one thing that you really want to do as a, as a great salesperson or a business development executive, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, um, is remove doubt. Don't have doubt in it. Try sort of, kind of, don't leave anything in the middle. When you speak about things, speak with certainty. Right. Yes, we will do this. What our, our results are this. Yeah, our results, they might be something like this. You might get, you know, a three, three X ROI or yeah, our average is a three X ROI on this. Yeah. I, I, I would say Dustin, to, to be perfectly honest, I would say what you just outlined there, I think that happens so much more than people might even think. Yeah. And probably yeah. there's a lot of people doing it themselves who aren't even catching themselves. So I think it's a great point yeah. to, to raise here because yeah, it's, I think it sometimes says people get caught because maybe you ask the question and I don't really know the answer, but I'm 100% sure my product can do it. So I go, oh, yeah, no, that sounds like something. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure we can do that. And yeah. right, I've just, in, instead of me going, hmm, I'll, I'll, let me check and get you back the proper answer on that. Yeah. And then move on. And now I'm, you know, just keep, it, keep everything definitive. Yeah, keep it definitive and really keep it. I mean, think about how important these decisions are 
to the prospect. Yeah. A lot of people, especially in high ticket sales, I mean, we're moving seven figures worth of money in some instances. Yeah. So I'm going to move seven figures worth of money because you and your team are going to try to make this work. <laughs> no, I need you to make this work, you know? And so speaking with certainty, it doesn't mean to make false promises. It doesn't mean to emblemish what you actually can accomplish, but just look for ways that you use passive and weak language mm -hmm. throughout your days and remove them from your vocabulary completely. I mean, you don't, you just don't need them. It projects a certain weakness. It projects a certain level of doubt. And I can feel, you know, some people, if they're listening to this, they're going to say, ah, you know, it's just little words. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, we'll try. It, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't seem like a big deal. I promise. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but humans are emotional. Yeah. We're not logical. Logically, you're absolutely right. Who cares? The word try or kind of, it's it's not a big deal logically, but emotionally it is. Yeah. And those are the types of things where, again, people might walk away from a presentation and we've probably all done it saying, man, the product sounds good, but for some reason I just, mm, I don't know. Yeah. And, and I think, that, hap I think that happens all the time. Just so you come away mm -hmm. just going, I wasn't convinced. He didn't really sound convincing because as you said, yeah. started to lose lose confidence in, in the exchange or, mm -hmm. or you know, or, or get a bit obs, you know, obstetrician there. But yeah. um, I, I think, I think that is so important. And I think it's even more important today because we've been through so many experiences. Trust building is massive. Yeah. And it's one of those, again, it, it's a lot of those gut feelings. Like the tough part about recognizing things like NLP is it's so hard to diagnose if that's why you're losing sales because your prospects will never really, they'll never tell you that because they probably don't know, mm -hmm. you know, they won't say, Oh, I didn't sign up because you use too much weak words. They don't even know what that <laughs> is. But they, all they know is, Hey, they didn't feel the way that they needed to feel to mm -hmm. move forward with you. They just didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. And they won't know why and it's just going to be a gut feeling that they had. And that's just how humans work. We're emotional creatures. So we're going to follow that emotion. Even if the logical part of our brains don't pick up on why the emotional side will win and, and tell that person don't follow through because there's not enough certainty here. Yeah. And, and the other thing that you mentioned a few moments ago was about the, I think sometimes we overlook, particularly in, in B2B sales, sometimes we overlook the emotional aspect of the people who are doing the buying. Yeah. Be Let's face it, as I always use this example, I said in, in B2C, I can walk over to Best Buy and buy the latest, you know, super duper TV. And what's yeah. going to happen to me is my wife's going to get really upset that I wasted <laughs> that and not something else, right? In a business sense, like it can be career enhancing if I pick my product, it can be career limiting if I don't. Um, yeah. so, so it's not just buying on behalf of the company it's also buying on behalf of my career and, and yeah. <laughs> here and I, people sometimes forget that there's a ton of emotion wrapped up in that and that's where the certainty any uncertainty is going to make me wobbly yeah exactly i mean the stakes are so high and even if it's a small purchase yeah. you know the stakes are still high for that person individually because the one thing that humans hate to do is feel like we made the wrong decision yeah I mean, it's embarrassing, right? So even if, you know, I bought something and it was 30 bucks and I take it to my friend, I go, oh, look at this cool. I bought this phone case, it's 30 bucks. And they go, oh, that phone case was on the news. It's like the worst phone case to ever be produced, <laughs> right? It's the 30 bucks is neither here nor there, but oh, shoot, man, I made, I just made a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. and that has an emotional impact on you. So one of the biggest fears for, for people who are in the buying phase is, will this be a mistake? Yeah. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest drop. Even if the price tag's not that big, nobody wants to feel like they made a mistake and nobody wants to feel, you know, like an idiot and buy something. Then they research it afterwards and they go, oh my God, this, you know, phone case is like the rated worst one. And even though it was 20 bucks and now I feel dumb having it. So that's a huge thing that people are wanting to avoid. Mm -hmm. And so your certainty needs to make them feel like, okay, this will not be happening with this product. Yeah. And I think finally, the other thing that, that happens when there's some uncertainty and this is happening and, and it happens particularly during recessions is you lose out to no decision that it, the status quo becomes, I'm not certain enough to make a move or to make a change, to make a purchase. Therefore I'm yeah. not going to do anything regardless of, you know, the consequences of not doing anything. And I think if you're losing out to, no decisions or status quo, it means that you're not creating enough certainty and value and change. Yeah, exactly. You're not creating enough certainty that is instigating the action that it takes to mm -hmm. essentially take a chance on you. 
Yeah. Because unless what they're doing right now is detrimentally sinking their ship, there may not be that big of a of a priority to say, hey, will this product, you know, maybe double our sales? It, mm -hmm. Maybe. Or we could change over and we look like total idiots because we ruined what we have now and what we have now is working just fine. Mm -hmm. So the stakes are even higher for you to to enforce action. Yeah. And obviously, obviously, just to know that being in a kind of a recessionary and a, in a more difficult environment, I think you have to pay even more attention. You've got to work hard, obviously, for to create uh, trust in that. But I think this is a good time to start looking more carefully about how you're communicating. Um, yeah. So listen, thanks for this, uh, Justin. All of Justin's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah. So, you know, right now I, I've stepped out of the residential sales space and I do what I love doing. And that is helping high performing sales professionals invest passively in commercial real estate assets. So I know the sales grind. I know those long, long days, um, those big checks coming in. And how do we turn those big checks into long term wealth? So I help high achieving sales professionals invest passively in commercial real estate. You can learn more about that at my website. Um, I have an ebook for you. It's called The Definitive Guide to Passive Real Estate Strategies at thedefinitiveguidebook.com. Yeah. And I believe uh, it was probably a good a good time, I think, isn't it? That, that the investment you probably get in at uh, much better, better yeah. than you would have a couple of years ago. It's an exciting time to be an investor. It's an exciting time to be a buyer. Um, mm -hmm. Not so much to be a seller, but we don't yeah, have any yeah. properties that we're selling right now, which is good. But yeah, it's a phenomenal time to to buy and it's a phenomenal time to invest. Absolutely. So go check it out. Go check out Justin. Thanks again, Justin. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again very soon.